From County College of Morris, this is CCM All Access. Hello, and welcome to Season 10 of CCM All Access, the program that brings you news and information from the County College of Morris. Students on campus, members of the community, people doing good things. I'm Mitchell Etta, and joining me today is Dr. William Solomons, who is the Criminal Justice Department Chair here at CCM. Welcome. Thanks, Mitchell. Nice to have you on the show. Thanks, pleasure to be here. So the first question I have for you is, how come you chose to teach at CCM? Well, I, I retired from my my, my career job in law enforcement in 2011, and uh, my career led me to teaching quite a bit. Part of my function uh, was teaching. So as I was working my way through my formal education, I began teaching as an adjunct um, at colleges, um, some online schools and local colleges. And I decided that uh, I think I thought that full-time teaching would be a, a really great job for me after I retired. So while I was adjunct teaching, I began looking for full-time positions in the area and it turned out that Morris was hiring. And I graduated from high school in Morris County. Uh, so it seemed like a natural fit. So I applied and went through the process and they hired me in 2013. How long did it take you to become chair of the criminal justice department? Well, at the time, there was a kind of a transition period with criminal justice. They were moving from one department to another. And uh, they, were, they were kind of in the process of looking to, to bring on someone who could be an assistant chair because we were under the engineering department. Mm -hmm. And the chair of the department was engineering. So he needed somebody to kind of oversee the criminal justice program as an assistant chair. So within a year or two after I joined, they, they, uh, they started looking officially for an assistant chair and I put in for it. And, and so probably about two years in, I was assistant chair and then just recently they created criminal justice as its own entity, as its own department. So hmm. kind of an evolution since then. Now, I know you said you graduated high school here in Morris County. Um, so let me ask you, which schools did you attend in terms of colleges and how difficult was gaining the education you needed to get your degrees? Well, I graduated Madison High School, um, but my only year at Madison High School was my senior year. I moved, okay. we moved to New Jersey my senior year of high school. So, uh, so to answer that question, it kind of, that move of that year, which is, you know, obviously difficult, it opened up schools for me. Where I lived before, there was limited educational opportunities. Um, so when I, uh, when we moved to, to Madison, um, I joined, I, I don't remember exactly how I learned about it, but I, I saw that the Madison Ambulance Corps was looking for people. So I thought that might be a good volunteer opportunity. So I got involved in the ambulance, um, you know, being a, a first aider with, with Madison. And I think that kind of led me into police work and ultimately looking at colleges that, you know, would help me along the lines of getting a job in law enforcement. Um, so I started uh, my educational career at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. That's where I, that's the, the school I went to first. Okay. So would you say that was, um, the volunteering was like a nice segue into, into that, into like your professional career with going into college and, and starting off that way? Yeah, I think if you asked anybody, any student here that was interested in law enforcement and you asked, or asked any officer, you know, why they wanted to do that job, it's because the first thing isn't, you know, to make money or to, you know, mm -hmm. do anything else. The first thing most people say is I want to help people. That's yeah. just who I am person, personality wise. You know, yeah. I like to, I like the feeling of helping people and, you know, being on an ambulance squad, being a first aider, that kind of put your foot in the door. And then of course you're going to emergency scenes and you're going to where police are and you're seeing what their interactions and what they're doing with, with the people in their particular, you know, times, this particular troubled time. Uh, you know, I think that kind of becomes appealing. So we have a lot of students who are volunteer firefighters and volunteer first aiders. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of a natural progression. And how long would you say uh, that volunteering period should be uh, in order for someone to really be ready for uh, what's, what's to come? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I, I don't know that I can say, you know, if you can go to a, a car accident and deal with whatever the carnage is that happens to be there, 
um, including potentially kids, you know, and just a, it's the worst possible time in that person's life, mm -hmm. right, you're responding to, whether you're a firefighter or, or a first responder or a police officer. You know, if you can go to that and say, and sort of take a step back and say, no, it's not me here personally, it's me as a first aider. That's the hat I wear now, and I can do what I need to do to make this situation better in any way that I can, then, you know, you have the right personality. There are some people that just can't do it. And that's not mm -hmm. a knock on them. It's just not something, it's not, they're not built for that. Yes, yes. All right, so. <clears throat> so how and when did you gain interest in the criminal justice field? Well, that would be probably as I continue to, to you know, ride on the ambulance and, you know, and answer calls, um, get to know the police officers in Madison, um, and understand the process by which, you know, one became a police officer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's at some point during the, I don't know, the year or two after I graduated high school, you know, Madison police was hiring and I applied. Um, I didn't make it the first time. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't know what to expect. It was the experience of that interview process. Uh, but the second time around they were hiring and I, was, and I was hired actually at 19 years old. I was hired and went to the police academy. What, uh, I'm just curious, what kind of credentials does one need to have in order to uh, apply for the police academy or try to join the police academy? Well, New Jersey's kind of a, a weird state in, that, in, in how you get to be a police officer. There's a couple different ways. There's, most people know of civil service, where you take a test that the state administers. They're saying they're going to do it every couple years now. It hasn't been that frequent in the past. But if you're 18 years old and you have a high school diploma or a GED, you're qualified to take a civil service test. Okay. So you and thousands of other people from across the state go to a testing place wherever you're assigned to. It could be CCM. I mean, this has been a testing site in the past. And you take a test and you, you note on your application where you'd like to work if you have preferences. And at some point they grade the, all the exams and you, be, you get on a list. Okay. Um, now the problem is, is that there are not, there's not really any rhyme or reason as to some departments being civil service and some not. For example, in Morris County, the Sheriff's Department is civil service. You have to take that test to get hired as a sheriff's officer. Randolph is not, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the larger departments in the state, you know, Trenton, Newark, they're in civil service because they hire a lot of officers. Um, but a, a lot of other departments aren't. So civil service is one way. The other way is you, you, you go directly to a department that's hiring and you say, I want to be a police officer in your community. And they have their own individual process, which could be a chief's test, which is a test administered by a, the State Chiefs of Police Association. Um, and then you go through a, you know, a battery of other tests. Could be a physical fitness test, it could be interviews, whatever their process is. Uh, and then they pick X number of candidates to move on to go to the police academy. Now some departments are, are resume, where there's no test, they just hire, they interview you, and they decide if you're a viable candidate. So it's, it's and some, their education requirements are different. Mm -hmm. You know, some departments require a two-year degree. Alternate route, if you, there's a, a, a mechanism by which you can apply directly to the police academy and go through their testing process and be, be admitted into the academy without being hired by a police department. But okay. then departments come to the academy and say, hey, do you have any alternate route candidates that need jobs. Mm -hmm. We're hiring, we want to save a lot of money on our hiring process. You know, give us the names of those, those uh, recruits and you might get hired that way too. So it's a really difficult process to understand, yeah. mm -hmm. especially for an 18, 19 year old you know, student who wants to get hired. So it can, it can definitely take a while is what you're saying? The well, civil service definitely can take a while. Um, you know, if it's, Probably on average, if you if you apply to a department and went through their testing process, it probably is generally a four to six month process to go through okay. all the testing, medical testing, PT testing, physical testing, mm -hmm. um, psychological exam if they you know do that. Interviews could be several interviews. So yeah, I mean four to six months is not would not be unusual. <clears throat> what is the importance criminal justice has on everyday life? Well, I mean, you, you, it, it affects everything. I mean, if you're driving your car and you get stopped by the police, it's, it's you know, one of the classes I teach um, most frequently is criminal law and procedure. Uh, and, and it's important, and I tell the students, it's important that you, even if you're not going to go to law enforcement, this is important th stuff because this is a Bill of Rights. This, mm -hmm. you know, this is Fourth Amendment search and seizure. This is Fifth Amendment. Do you have to talk to the police? You know, uh, you know we see this in the news all the time. 
do the police have the right to ask you if they could search your vehicle? You know, do the police have the right to pat you down? Um, do the police have to t tell you you have the that you have the right to an attorney in any given circumstance? So, you know, we the more we're aware of our rights as private citizens, the better we understand what the police can and can't do. Right. Okay. And if we understand what they can and can't do, then we can draw the line and say, look, this is not appropriate, and, and perhaps it's not a police intentionally acting contrary to the Constitution or case law, but there's not proper supervision. So, mm -hmm. you know, they need to know, someone needs to tell them, hey, this is not appropriate behavior uh, per the Constitution or per case law. So, you know, everybody should be aware of what rights they have. You know, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't watch TV and think you know, yeah. you know, exactly what, what their obligation is and what your obligation is as a, as a private citizen. Yep, yep. So would you say it, can be a stressful job being a police officer, knowing that you have to that you have to have all of these rights, like almost memorized or in the back of your head while you're doing your job. Like, would you say it can be a little stressful? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a very stressful job. I mean, there's there's good stress and bad stress. I mean, obviously, you know, there there are people that you, it's almost impossible to know everything, mm -hmm. right? But experience is a great tool. You know, it's a great tool to learn what's going on and to learn how to deal with people. So, uh, you know, knowing sometimes the downfall of, of new officers is, look, they just can't grasp everything. Yeah. It's just a lot to take in. But it's not so much that you have to have a law degree or you have to have a social work degree, mm -hmm. you know, or a degree in psychology or, you know, any of those other degrees. It's, it's experience and counting on somebody with you that knows a supervisor or another officer that has had experience in that situation and knows the best way to handle it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you for sharing. And now we're going to take a break. Please stay tuned and we'll be right back. Choosing a college is a big, big, big deal. But I know I started right, because CCM is in the top 2% of community colleges in the nation. And at County College of Morris, I get to choose over 100 programs. Whether you're just out of high school, like me, exploring career options, like me, or seeking lifelong learning, like me, make CCM your choice, like me. Go big and visit ccm.edu and aspire to be you. And we're back on CCM All Access. I'm Mitchell Etta, and we're here with Dr. William Solomons. Welcome back. Thank you. So this next question I have for you uh, is, I read about a case you were investigating early on in your career, uh, one that hit close to home, you said. Do you mind sharing that story? Sure. So I was with the um, Somerset Prosecutor's Office, and when I joined uh, the Prosecutor's Office, I was assigned to the Child Abuse Sex Crimes Unit. That was my first assignment. and. At some point, uh, we became aware, because of a required notification, a, a statutory notification um, by a, uh, someone in the medical field, that a, a man had admitted to sexually assaulting a young boy. Now, so we knew who the man was, but we didn't know who the boy was. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, to go to him and ask is really not how to, the best way to conduct an investigation. You try and gather everything you can yep. outside of, of speaking to the, to the suspect. So, we, you know, we, we looked at where he lived and, and where he worked and everything we could find out about him to see if we could find a connection. Was he, a, you know, was he involved in youth sports or other youth activities, scouts or anything else like that? And there was nothing. I mean, there, we could find no supervision in any in any respect of this man uh, and any young young male so really all we had left was to talk to him mm -hmm. and so we we brought him in and um, I talked to him for a while and I was able to to get him to admit to tell me the name of the of the kid and uh, unfortunately uh, the 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 uh, young uh, boy's name was him close to home because I, I had known him. I had taught, I had coached baseball, a youth league, and uh, I had this young uh, male as a, as a player on the team. Mm. And I, of course, I had no idea that, that he was involved. He never ex he expressed to me any yep. time because I was a police officer at the time. 
that anything had happened to him. But uh, and I knew his mom. His, his, she was uh, he was uh, she was a single mother. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously tough raising a kid, and uh, yeah. it was a good kid, but kind of a, you know, kind of a laid back, you know, not a, not a very, um, kind of a timid kid. Okay. So, I could see, knowing my experience with dealing with child abuse, that this was the kind of kid that those people might target. Mm -hmm. Very reserved, very respectful. Uh, won't stand so, up for oneself, something like that? a lot, like won't really stand up for oneself yeah, in a situation you know, like that. Yeah, you know, and just feels like it's his, it's his fault, you okay. know, and is not going to say anything to his mom. So, you know, it, it, it was, it was unfortunate because he was really a good kid and he'd had some rough mo patches in his life, and you know, so it, it was, un it was really unfortunate that, that uh, it was him, any kid, but obviously because I knew him, but you know, uh, on the other side of it, you know, I knew his mom. So I think it helped when I had to tell her what, what mm -hmm. had happened. Of course, she was devastated. Um, but I think it helped a little bit that she knew me and that I, had, that I had, was the one who was interviewing his kid, you know, her, mm -hmm. her child. So. so that leads me to, to ask, um, how did handling that case have an impact on your professional career? Well, you know, at that point, and I don't recall how long I had worked with the prosecutor's office at that time. I, I don't think it was more than a than a year or so, but you know, when you handling those types of cases, you, you kind of have to be a unique person. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a, a a certain personality to interview kids and and people that were victimized in that way. So I think that the experience of dealing with it with people I knew, it, it gave me a sort of an empathy. I understood a little more because I knew them. Mm -hmm. They were they were people that I was friendly with, uh, and that I had known. So, it 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 was more difficult for me, but it also gave me a, a recognition of understanding from their perspective what it was like to hear that this had happened to your child. Yeah. So I think in the future I became a little more, you know, aware of that when I dealt with parents in those situations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so next I have. Uh, do you mind touching upon your younger brother and explaining uh, what he went through affected you? Yeah, so I have a, a, a younger brother who is um, six years younger than me. He was adopted as a baby. He's an African-American. Uh, we lived on the East Coast at the time, and uh, um, we moved around a little bit. We ended up back in New Jersey, and at, at a certain point, I was working as a police officer, and he was... Um, he was he was of the age where he wasn't sure what he was going to do. He was kind of, I think, he was still in high school, just out of high school, and he um, he lived in a town, a very a very blue collar town. And I, at the point at that at the point where this these things were happening, I was in law enforcement. He wasn't, but he was giving it a, a, some consideration. Mm -hmm. He thought maybe that's what he wanted to do. And I would talk to him periodically, and he would talk about. Um, being stopped by the police. Now, you know, I wasn't with him driving. I don't know exactly what he was doing or not doing, but it was kind of a, f a frequent occurrence. To me, it was anyway. It wasn't every day, but it was. And they would see uh, the name, or they would ask, or he would offer that his, you know, his brother was worked in, you know, the county or worked as a police officer, and he would tell me about an attitude change. You know, in the officer, and invariably he would just they would say, "Okay, you know, go ahead, you know, you know, have a good day." Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he was a he is a good kid. Now he's not a good kid anymore, but at the time he was a good kid, and and he you know he didn't get in trouble, and he, you know, he was very respectful. And I thought, well, you know, if he's having these, this is real life examples of perhaps there is some profiling going on. I'd never seen it. Mm -hmm. as a law enforcement officer. Not to say it didn't happen, I just wasn't exposed to it. Uh, but it sort of gave some credibility to the, the possibility that, you know, maybe there are some officers out there who who do that, who mm -hmm. profile and who stop people based on the color of their skin. Um, so it kind of gave me some some real world experience in that regard yeah. to be on the lookout for that. That, hey, maybe it's not this term that just exists somewhere out there in the, in the universe. That there actually, maybe there is some... Mm -hmm something to it. And did that, did that almost like 
come as a shock to you, or was that something that you you knew could have been a possibility just based off of past events or you know I, I think Mitchell I think it was more of a shock to me I mean I, like I said if I if I had been exposed to it um, as an officer uh, then I think I it, it would have made more sense to me at that moment but I never was exposed to it you know mm -hmm. I, I I hadn't really seen a lot of, of racism it, it, growing up um, and I hadn't been exposed to it as a police officer, as a, as somebody that's you know in a locker room or in the squad room or around other officers. So I, I think I it, I knew it was there. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's there. You can't ignore it. Uh, but there was really no nothing tangible that I could hold on to. Say, yeah, this is really happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the moment where it really became tangible to me that like, hey, this happens, and stuff that I really need to look out for. You know, because this is obviously, if it's happening, it's not. It's a real life thing. It's a real it's life real, thing. And it's yeah. kind of like with talking to students and students saying, hey, you know, this, I got stopped and, and this officer asked to search my car. And, 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 you know, well, what were you doing? Well, I, you know, I wasn't doing anything. You know, it just, he just asked me. And, you know, there's sort of no reason for a student to lie to me about that. I'm not a police officer. I'm just a professor, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I believe them. And it's, it's important to me as a professor to say, look, I'm not telling you what to do or not do, right? But, you know, this is how you should act in this particular circumstance. Mm -hmm. You know, do they, you should know, do they have the right to ask you even to search your car? Do they even have the right to search your car if they say they do, right? So it, it, it lets them know that, hey, you know, th knowing your rights is important. Yeah. And knowing what exists in the real world may not necessarily mesh with your perception of what you think is is happening in their world or what mm -hmm. happens on TV. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, what, or, what was the organization you became involved with early on? What was it like? And it was the one that you that involved traveling to faraway places. So, yeah, so my, uh, my uh, family, my mother worked for AT&T and she was involved in a group of retired AT&T employees who um, they, they developed this trip that they would do every year, um, this what they called the Santa Goodwill trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was able to, on several occasions before I um, came here, to, to go on those trips. And they would go all over the world, and they would give you a Santa suit, and you would bring, you know, candy or, you know, um, uh, health items like lotion or soaps or things like that that would be useful. And you would play Santa and you would go to either, you know, orphanages or senior communities or somewhere, um, uh, some group and you would, you would you know, put in your Santa suit and it would be a big event. So when I started here, I wanted to try and continue it. So for, uh, for the first couple of years, we were able to, to do those trips with some students, but um, we haven't done, obviously COVID, Mm -hmm. Travel has been a problem, but it's um, it's an opportunity to see, to travel, right? Yep. Because a lot of people don't travel beyond you know their world, and, yeah. and including you know, you know maybe Cancun where it's really not not so much travel. It's nice, but it's not really you know going to to places that you wouldn't normally go. You mm -hmm. know, going to to Peru or or going to Africa. You know, places where you see people and how they live. Yeah, and, and how their world outlook differs from yours, and it kind of gives you a perspective um, that you not a lot of people see. You know? So, mm -hmm. in that regard, I think it was great. You know, just to just to travel someplace else and see other cultures, I think is just you just it's you can't beat it in terms of yeah experience. Yep, and you'd say like the traveling aspect is just as important uh, as like going to the orphanages. Like it's it's it contributes just as much to the experience as going to the orphanages and dressing up as Santa and doing all that, you would say? Yeah, absolutely. No, the travel is just, you know, getting people out of their comfort zone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're in law enforcement, you're going to be out of your comfort zone your entire shift, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You're going to be dealing with people in situations that you, there's no way you could have prepared for. Yep. Right? So you have to say, okay, let me take a deep breath. I'm here. What do I need to do? I'm in another country. I don't know the language. 
there's not a 7-Eleven or a Wawa or a McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. How am I going to eat? How am I going to pay for this stuff? How am I going to ask questions? You know, it's all about acclimating yourself to the environment that you're in at that particular moment. And traveling and seeing other cultures is a great way to, to do that. You know, mm -hmm. it it's adds a little stress, which is, you know, that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but it lets you, hey, look, I can do this. You know, it's not as daunting as it, it might have appeared. Yep. Kind of like that final project, you know, that's the, you have to do for, the, for a class mm -hmm. that you wait till the last minute to do. So let me ask you one last question. You once said that there are intense highs and lows in law enforcement. What does that mean exactly? You know, it, some of the a lot of the misconceptions about criminal justice come from TV. Everybody likes crime shows, mm -hmm. you know, but in the crime shows, you, you know, it's, it's set up that, you know, there's an officer dressed really nice, you know, and he goes out to the crime scene and he collects evidence yep. and he takes the evidence back and he goes into a lab, puts on a white coat and then he does this. Yeah. And then in the last 10 minutes, they go out and they <laughs> like arrest somebody, cliche show. right? Like it's over an hour, right? Uh -huh. It's very intense. There's shootouts and there's all kinds of excitement. It, it, there's nothing that misrepresents law enforcement more than television shows. I mean, even live TV shows are edited so that the action is back to back. Because yep. in reality, if you did a TV show that was really representative of a police officer's tour, it would be, no one would watch it. It would be intensely boring. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so no matter where you work, even the cities that are that are much bigger, they're not for the most part, they're not running to calls all night. I mean, yes, there are some that are. But for the most part, the communities in Morris County and Somerset County and even Middlesex County to a large extent, you know, they, there's a time of the night where it slows down. Yep. You know, it's just you're not doing anything. There's just no traffic. There's nothing really going on. Uh, so that's the, diff that's the dichotomy of police work is that, you know, you could go hours and hours and hours of just driving around. And mm -hmm. not do anything. And then all of a sudden there's a domestic dispute or there's a person with a weapon, you know, or there's a motor vehicle stop where the person is, you know, there's a, an issue. You know, there, there's no, there's very few officers anywhere that have ever fired their gun in line of duty. It mm -hmm. just, I never did. I know maybe one or two officers that did. Uh, it just doesn't happen. Yep. But there are intense situations where all of a sudden you go from zero to, to 60. Yep instantly and you have to be prepared for that yeah and that's what it is and you come back down after it's over you come back down and say oh okay i was prepared i trained properly i handled the situation the way I, I was trained to do and i'm i'm safe and people are safe and we've handled it correctly um and that's what police work is really all about it's being prepared for those very intense situations whether it's you know interviewing a boy that mm -hmm. you're you know or telling his mom that that he was assaulted or you know, the motor vehicle accident where there's kids involved and mom and dad are hurt, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you never know. Every day is different and you, you can't, you can't prepare for every possible event that might happen on a particular mm -hmm. shift. And that's how you know you did your job and you did your job well. That's, that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. This concludes another edition of CCM All Access. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time.